Hi, everybody. Welcome today to his panel. We have a very exciting topic for everybody today called Got Email? Get Beamy. My name is Jennifer Cannon, the Director of Corporate Partnerships from Email Expert. Today, we have an outstanding panel of speakers and thought leaders here to talk about Beamy and what it takes to get your brand's logo in your customers' inboxes. This exciting conversation is coming up, so let's just start off by meeting our panelists. Rahul, why don't we start off with you? Hi, everyone. I'm Rahul Pavar, uh, CEO and founder of Redshift. We're a cybersecurity company that helps organizations deploy and implement DMARC and in the process, get ready for BIMI. Next up, we have Chris Bailey. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Bailey. I'm the vice president of Trust Services for Intrust Data Card and one of the uh, creators of the Verified Mark Certificate uh, for BIMI. Next, we have Jacob Alexa. Hi, my name is Jacob Alexa, and I'm the CEO and founder of MailKit, an ESP out of Czech Republic. And we are big on BIMI, and uh, we run a big BIMI validator and generator and write a ton of articles around BIMI. And we have participated in a lot of talks with the BIMI group over the years. Thank you. And lastly, we have somebody named Mark Serkin here to join us today. Mark. Mark and I used to work together at Third Door Media, but I will let you take it from here, Mark. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, hi, everybody. My name is Mark Serkin. I am Senior Vice President of Marketing and Technology at Third Door Media. You may have not heard of that brand, uh, um, that company. Our brands are MarTech Today, uh, MarTech Conference, Search Marketing Expo, SMX. Uh, and obviously, we are uh, thrilled to be here. Thanks. So today we'll be talking about Vimy and how to actually get this implemented. So I thought that we would structure this conversation by starting at the very beginning. So let's start off with what exactly is a Vimy record and how is it different from DMARC? Okay, I'll take this one. Uh, so uh, Vimy record is a DNS record that is fairly similar to a DMARC record, uh, except unlike DMARC, which uh, sets uh, your policies and uh, reporting addresses, BIMI extends on your existing DMARC uh, and requires uh, DMARC to be in place and defines where your uh, logo uh, resides for your brand and uh, where your uh, optional uh, BMC verified mark certificate resides. So does that guarantee that emails are going to be delivered having BIMI? No, not really. Uh, BIMI is really only about the logo. It does not have any positive or negative impact on deliverability. Is there any cost to having BIMI? Well, there, there's certainly costs to uh, set up the BIMI record uh, itself because you need to get the, the right logo. So probably some uh, costs with the designer. Uh, and there's definitely a cost to get uh, the underlying DMARC inf uh, enforcement deploy. But uh, other than that, there's no cost to publishing a BIMI record. Uh, although uh, some, some mailbox providers have indicated that, uh, well, they will support BIMI itself, uh, it might be uh, a paid uh, paid service, uh, so their way to monetize, right? Because they currently have other uh, other means of displaying uh, the logos, and they don't want to cannibalize their their business. So you mentioned DMARC records and how that's a requirement. So Rahul, I just want to go through specifically what needs to be done on the DMARC end for BIMI to be implemented. Sure. So the BIMI spec does have specific requirements uh, for DMARC enforcement before uh, BIMI logos can really be display displayed. And so what that means is an organization that wants to opt into BIMI in addition 
to uh, setting up the BIMI records and getting their logos verified and trademarked as Jakob had illustrated. It also needs to get their domain into uh, an acceptable level of DMARC compliance. So to remind everyone, DMARC is really to sort of ensure that your domain cannot be trivially spoofed and impersonated by services that are not authorized to send on behalf of your domain. So to do that, you need your domain to have a DMARC policy of quarantine 100% or higher, which is a pretty high level of compliance for your domain. And this has to be done for your organizational domain in addition to your marketing domain as per the current spec. So are there any risks or benefits that you think to deploying DMARC um, besides the requirement for BME? Uh, yeah, I mean, DMARC is usually a, a reasonably complex undertaking for organizations because uh, you don't want to get it wrong. So if you think about what what opting into DMARC means is you're basically opting into email authentication. So normally you can you know, supply email authentication or you cannot supply email authentication and mailbox recipients will do with it what they may. With, uh, with a published DMARC policy, what you're really telling the world is that DMARC now all my email is is authenticated in some way or form. So you, you now essentially have to make sure that all your sources of email are appropriately authenticated for them to be delivered in a reasonable way. So that is one of the risks associated with DMARC. And that's why usually it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a trivial project for most organizations of any scale. On the other hand, though, once you've done that, you get a couple of benefits. One is you may sort of start to experience some uh, deliverability benefits once everything's been bedded down, depending on what your current authentication status was. So if you're authenticating a lot more email, a lot more correctly now than you were before, uh, you can see some benefits from that. And then there are also uh, security benefits because essentially you can't be trivially spoofed anymore, which uh, is one of the reasons why a lot of our customers actually start this entire journey to begin with. So Mark, I know that you and your brand um, have been on this BIM and Jeremy journey. Is there anything that you want to add in, in addition to what Rahul and Jacob have already told us? From the marketing perspective, I yeah, think. sure. From the marketing perspective, I mean, it it took us um, it took us far too long, frankly, to sort of wrap our heads around the import of this. It seemed so foreign at first, um, but we sort of stepped our way into it. It took a, it took a while, not because it's very hard to do, but we were sort of trying to be measured about it, um, and and you know, moving from nothing to a quarantine state to most recently a reject state for basically all of our domains. Um, it just was. It just was a long journey, and we we took our time trying to understand what are the impacts at each domain level uh, for this stuff. The the spoofing, um, which truthfully we were sort of ignorant to, if I can say that, like we're like, oh wow, this is happening, and it's happening a lot, is now completely stopped, which is great. Um, so I think there's instantaneous benefit there. But now I think, as Rahul was saying, we're starting to see as these things sort of get bedded in, like improvements in engagement. We think, although it's hard to measure. That more emails getting into the inbox, not just to the to, to the server. So it's been it's been an interesting uh, it's been an interesting journey. It's been good. So Rahul, how long does it typically take to get started with BIMI? I know Mark had mentioned that it's been quite the journey, and I'm sure for a lot of marketers it really is. But say everything is laid out in the perfect state, perfect world. How long would it take to get ready? I don't think we've ever seen that perfect world. Uh, it, it, it does vary. And honestly, this is a difficult question to answer because it is very much one of those how long is a piece of string questions. Um, but I can certainly tell you from, from our experience, and you know, obviously we work with we work with some smaller businesses, sure, but we also work with some very large businesses. And um, the complexity of that journey and as a result, the time it takes can vary quite a bit depending on a uh, the organizational energy, I think, behind the project, right? It's hard to put a quantity on that, but that's that's obviously, uh, that has a big impact on it. Uh, to some extent, it depends on the kind of vendors, the, the kind of mail services that you're actually using across your organization. And then, of course, it does depend on your inherent organizational complexity. So typically, if you're a large organization, you can expect it to take longer because there's a lot more shadow IT you're going to discover, uh, a lot of things that you didn't know about, and you need to find, you know, the appropriate person to, to essentially make those changes. But to give you some examples, uh, you know, we did a deployment uh, not that long ago with, you know, a very large uh, multinational government 
uh, agency, and they had to get it done for a number of reasons. And so there was a lot of organizational impetus behind that. And I think the, that was around sort of six to eight weeks. And this is for a reasonably complex organization. So I would say if you really want to get it done at pace, you could you probably budget about eight weeks, assuming you can line everything else up. You could do it faster, and we have seen it done faster, certainly. Conversely, we have seen it done slower when um, you know people wanted to be a lot more cautious and measured about how they want to roll it out. But I think eight weeks is a reasonable spot for many organizations who want to get this done. So one thing that we've talked about and was mentioned earlier is the verified mark certificate. And Chris, I was hoping that maybe you could speak a little bit to what the VMC really is and, and why it's necessary. Sure. Um, well, the, the VMC uh, stands for Verified Mark Certificate, and that is a, a certificate type that is really acts as a container. Um, and in, in that container actually contains uh, a uh, logo which uh, is relating to a, a registered trademark for an organization. So it uh, is a one for one match. Uh, in addition, uh, that container also contains the organization information, and that information is confirmed by an independent third party, which uh, validates that. And that, that container is cryptographically signed by that organization that validates the information. And so when a mailbox provider or another entity uh, pulls that information, they know that that information has been indeed verified. And that's what, one of the reasons why it's called verified mark certificates. So that uh, in itself is, is uh, you can think of it as a, um, a version of, of BIMI that uh, provides that verification mechanism for, uh, for that logo. Is there a difference between wordmark and figurative or visual trademarks? Yeah, so um, when we're talking about trademarks, um, there's uh, it's a new world for for uh, many of the the people in this audience because they're not uh, and, you know they're not uh, lawyers. Uh, so, but in the simplest uh, uh, way I can explain this is um, a figurative mark is basically exactly what it sounds. It's a figure, or a diagram, or an image that actually shows that uh, you know what you usually think of. Uh, as a as a trademark, um, it's literally like a bottle, or it could be you know something else that represents that organization. Um, a word mark is is exactly what it sounds like, and that is a word that you can use in in multiple combinations. So if you actually have the word mark for, as I'll use my own company, uh, Entrust. Um, I can choose to use any font um, I want to and, and basically show it in any stylized way as long as it's legible uh, I, and I spell out the word entrust. What I can't do is, is make it illegible and try to make it totally new logo. So it's a reasonability test. So one's an image, um, that figurative mark, and one's a word mark that allows you know, more flexibility for that, that word. And then, of course, there's a combination, which is usually called a combination mark. Um, these terms vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, um, but they're pretty straightforward. Um, you know, generally, your legal department is the one who generally uh, deals with these types of, of issues. But uh, for the VMC, the marketing organization can choose from one of these registration marks to, uh, to be uh, inserted into their verified mark certificate. And where can they file for those trademarks, Chris? Well, uh, Many countries have their own uh, way of filing for trademarks, um, but for the verified mark certificates, at least in the pilot that we're uh, working with Google on, there's seven uh, official uh, trademarks that we're working with, uh, trademark jurisdictions. Uh, those jurisdictions are the US, Canada, UK, Germany, uh, Australia, and the European Union, as well as Japan. Uh, we also are looking at adding other jurisdictions like uh, Spain, uh, but you should remember if I didn't list one of the countries that your organization might be in, many times organizations fall in one of these other jurisdictions to have a broader uh, control over um, you know, where they uh, want to do business. So especially for organizations to do uh, business outside their own country, they might apply for the into the US or for the EU. For example, that gives them a broad, um, you know, protection, you know, for for their trademark. There's one last burning question that I have for you, in particular, Chris. Um, has Google announced when Bimmy will be available in their inboxes? 
So right now, Google is running a pilot and is thought at the end of the pilot, uh, they'll move into GA. Uh, so once we have a successful pilot, uh, then uh, that date though has not been announced. Um, but uh, I, I can tell you right now, we are, um, we're about uh, nine uh, months in uh, to the pilot. So um, that's the only thing I can really reveal. It's up to uh, Google to ultimately decide when that uh, pilot is over and they move into GA. So Mark, I have a couple questions for you since you've been on the marketing and the IT side of this, but working with vendors to implement and deploy BIMI. How would you recommend that marketers and IT talk to each other when it comes to BIMI and DMARC and discuss the subdomains and the top level domain um, securities that they need? Yeah, I mean, at our organization, you know, we're not we're not a huge organization, so marketing and IT are kind of collapsed into what we call marketing and marketing operations. And so there's a close relationship because, frankly, I own both of those functions, which is convenient for me, but not true for everybody. Um, but you know, what's been interesting in my experience is getting educated myself and my team so that we can explain it to the other stakeholders, and that's been really tricky because it's um, it's not clear. Uh, it's it's a little fuzzy around the edges of like, you can't really promise that deliverability is gonna get better right away. You know, we're sort of hoping it's gonna get better. BIMI is not a thing that's, as Chris just said, it's not sort of in availability. There's not a lot of evidence of it in the marketplace today. There's obviously some information out there, but there's not a lot. And spoofing isn't something that people see on a day-to-day -day basis. So I found myself developing talking points across the organization to sort of explain why is this important. It's been an interesting journey though, because um, some of it is subtle. And you know, we've started to pull, now that we've started with um, certain domains in, in Reject, we've started to now pull before and after and start monitoring the, those results pretty closely in order to convince the other stakeholders, like, look, the water's safe. This is a good thing. Um, and we're gonna see benefit over time for it. Um, it turns out the technology side, while confusing at first, um, and I, I do have RedSif, we are a RedSif customer um, to thank for some of this, but we went through our own learning journey in terms of testing all the various tools out there. And it's really confusing, it, but it turns out to be pretty simple, right? It's effectively a text file that changes the policy. So there isn't that much that really needs to get done, but feeling comfortable in making that change and making sure everybody's on the same page. There's a, there were a lot of talking points developed and a lot of conversation that happened organization-wide, both at the executive level and then at the functional level to explain all that stuff. What were some of the conversations that you had around the marketing benefits in terms of, you know, weighing the value of adding BIMI and this entire journey that you've been on? Um, what are some of the metrics that you would look for to kind of, you know, bolster back to those stakeholders? Yeah, I mean, like like any marketer, we're um, in the ever search of how do we get uh, how do we get into the inbox? How do we get higher engagement, open click, click to open, you know, reduce unsubscribes, all, all of the standard email uh, marketing metrics that we all that we all care about. You know, BIMI promises, you know, for us, we have known brands in our communities. Search Engine Land uh, is a known brand if you're a search marketer, for example. And so the idea that we can have the Search Engine Land logo show up in an inbox, uh, we think will have benefit. People go, oh, that's a trusted email from a trusted person, um, you know, from a trusted brand visually. So that should result in better engagement. That's what we're betting on. And that's what this comes down to for us is, you know, can we drive our newsletter subscription engagement higher? Can we get more event revenue? Can we drive more leads for our customers? So it just comes down to the to the core uh, levers that we're trying to pull for our for our business. Where were some of the resources that you um, you and your team had to or where did you go to to find some of those resources and information? You know, it's, I, I, would, I would say that it was different a year, a year and a half ago when we first started this journey. The tools that we used um, were really IT focused tools. I won't mention any of the names, but you just, you know, go to Google and sort of like, how do I manage this? There weren't that many articles and BIMI still is just kind of a shady thing. Like, what is it? How do I understand it? Obviously conferences like this um, help significantly. But we read a lot and we tried to understand. I mean, I reached out to contacts at different email vendors to try to understand what's the, what's the infrastructure here look like? What's happening? What, what are these? I mean, the truth is I've been doing email marketing for years and years and years. And it's only in the last two years that I ever thought about any of this DKIM, DMARC, SPF, like all the alignment, all this stuff. Like I never gave it one second thought. And now all of a sudden it's a core component to making sure that our infrastructure is set up properly. So it was a lot of reading, a lot of talking to experts. 
Um, but I think it's changed in the last six months. I think it's been demystified by by vendors who are trying to explain this better, not just to the IT people, but to the marketing people in terms of what are the benefits here uh, in doing this. Thank you. That's very, very helpful and insightful because I'm sure many of our viewers today are looking for some of that information themselves. Um, one question that we have is regarding Verizon Media Groups and Google's implementations of BIMI. Can one of you speak to the difference, the differences between those two deployments? Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, so I'm not, not a representative of BMG or, or Google, so I cannot say exactly uh, their internal differences, but from the outside, uh, uh, Verizon and Yahoo was the, uh, the first one uh, on the market with their uh, BIMI implementation. And uh, their implementation is uh, uh, primarily based on uh, brand recognition and uh, reputation. So uh, even if you set up your BB record according to, to the standard and you have the, the DMARC enforcement and everything in place as you should, it doesn't guarantee that your uh, logo will be displayed. It's based on Yahoo recognizing, we know this brand, there's sufficient reputation, now we will show the logo, right? Uh, Google's decision is, uh, or Google's implementation is still based on reputation, definitely, uh, but uh, they want to be 100% uh, or 110% sure that uh, there's no room for uh, impersonation of a brand. So they chose to uh, implement uh, using a uh, verified mark certificate. So that is a requirement while Yahoo doesn't require certificates. Mark, is this one of the challenges that you've run into um, with, with any of your processes? Uh, with all of them, right? I mean, the, the lack of consistency and standards here you know, with no guaranteed upside, it's all theory. Sure, the promise is there, uh, but it's a lot of work, and it's and it's confusing. And so, you know, getting getting this stuff demystified is kind of step one. Uh, and then again, communicating to stakeholders like this is the journey we're on. We're committed to this because we think we're going to get this result. But when you hear stuff like Google's going to make a different decision than Yahoo, you just sort of shake your head and go, it's just more of the same, right? Like, I get it, but it's frustrating. Right. Jacob. I'll add that there's, uh, you, know, you have to keep in mind that BIMI is still just a draft standard, so it's not set in stone. And many of these uh, decisions on Google's part or Yahoo's part are driven by, you know, uh, making sure that this is as good as it can be, as safe as it can be, and that. In the end, it's all for for their customers. It's it's not something necessarily for techies. It shouldn't be for techies. It shouldn't be something that only serves the, the marketer, but first and foremost, that it serves uh, the client, the, the, the recipient. Right. I want to know that I'm really opening an email from Marketing Land before I actually open that email. Yes. What are some of the common challenges that you've seen in authenticating non-marketing emails? So thinking of like transactional emails through some of the other big vendors um, where those transactional emails might be automated. Rahul, I, I think this might be a good one for you. Um, thinking of tools like Salesforce, Marketo, Zendesk, um, you know, what are some of those challenges that they have with the non-marketing emails? Sure. Well, I mean, I think most of those uh, services that you mentioned have a pretty good handle on uh, authentication technologies and actually sending DMOC compliant emails, assuming you know you've got the right tooling and support. To walk you through that process because you know it's not it doesn't necessarily just work out of the box you've got to do some stuff basically but it's not rocket science right this there there are millions of domains out there who are doing dmark today so you're not alone so with the right tooling and with the right know-how you can make progress where we found actually you know 
without naming names, where we found a lot of the challenges with getting organizations to fully deploy DMOC on their organizational domain. We found them in typically more of the niche um, ecosystem. So, you know, typically if you're looking at, um, I don't know, uh, legal automation tools, for example, uh, tools that most people in the organization probably don't even know the organization uses. Those are the sorts of things where, especially in larger orgs, you find uh, vendors who you know really aren't as up to date with the current standards for email authentication and the like. So you might have challenges, you know, signing your signing your messages with DKIM correctly or setting the return path alignments or other sort of like little technical things that you have to do. Uh, your your major vendors, especially the ones that are used by marketing folks, are usually pretty good because email authentication is a pretty important part of getting the whole marketing stack right. So. So uh, they're usually pretty good. A lot of the other services, once you start to get into the long tail, you usually have a bit more of a lag. Like, you know, sometimes you can't make those changes yourself. You need to, you know, send someone an email or ironically to, to, to make those changes on your behalf. So those are the sorts of friction points you can sometimes find. Sure. Mark, I see you smiling and, and nodding along there. Are there some challenges or anything from your story and your personal journey that you've been on um, that you want to share with our audience and maybe some tips that they can take away from this? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's there's so many. Um, you know, I already talked about just understanding it at its fundamental level and being able to explain it, not just to others, but to yourself. Like, okay, this is why we're doing this, this is important. But like, we have, you know, like for us, our infrastructure stack is primarily Marketo for outbound marketing emails. But like Rahul said, we have a gajillion other systems from customer support systems to our event registration systems, webinar platforms that all do a, a variety of emails. And this process has made us sort of take an inventory of that, which is a good thing. And then make decisions on, you know, how are we going to manage this stuff? And um, what does it, what does it mean uh, to each of these systems? I, I want to say that this is a Marketo issue and it has to do with us, not Marketo, but the way that our Marketo setup is, is that we're using multiple domains to send emails out of. And so we can set our policies for those, but Rahul just mentioned return path. I only have one return path. So like, I'm not totally in alignment, but it's okay because I am passing on DCAM. Like it, it gets really complicated and frustrating as a marketer, because I just want this to be simple. Like, okay, I have permission to email you. Why can't I just email you? And why aren't you getting it, <laughs> right? Like, because the vendors are making different decisions, but the multi-brand thing, um, and and the way we've implemented Marketo, kind of um, that's what it was. That's what was making me smile because I remember thinking, okay, so I I know that I should achieve alignment, but I literally can't with the current stack that I have. But it's okay because I can do these other things. So understanding and balancing that is just become, you know, it's 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 just a set of things like anything else that you just make decisions on and then move forward. And so I think we're doing the right things. We hope we're doing the right things. We're getting the support we needed from the vendors. But that's that's why I'm smiling because it just like it just never ends. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I do want to uh, add one thing to that because you know I think sometimes it's it's easy to kind of lose track about why things are the way they are, uh, and I. I I, having worked in the space for some time now, I think it's important to note that a lot of these decisions aren't, aren't arbitrary. They're, they're, they're for a reason, like why return bottle line? Why is that even a thing, right? It's there to essentially make sure that DMARC is not vulnerable to certain types of attacks that happen in the real world. So as a sort of email authentication security standard to begin with, uh, some of these things are hard because, you know, security is hard. So uh, I think Jacob made the point earlier, uh, the entire ecosystem is trying to come together and do all of this in a way that's safe and effective uh, and doesn't create new problems when they weren't problems before. So so to do all of this correctly, I think that's where some of this complexity comes comes from. And I appreciate that it is it is harder than I think we'd all want it to be, but it's mostly there for a reason. Right, and when you talk about security too, I think one important thing for folks to take away, um, I know a lot of folks, they think cybersecurity, why would anybody be targeting me and my brand in particular, but what we really need to think of is they're not targeting you specifically or your brand in particular. You really have to think of it like burglars driving up and down the street, casing houses and just looking to see who leaves a window open or a door open. Um, they're not targeting somebody very specifically. And typically when there has been some kind of cybersecurity hack, they're in that system for roughly six months before folks on the IT side or the brand side even realize that there has been some kind of security compromise. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm wondering if we have any questions from the audience that are coming in yet. Um, I'm just going to pull up that window and check, but I would like to open this up for some Q and A. Um, if anybody in the audience has any questions that they'd like to ask the experts right now, but while we wait for those to come in, um, I guess, Chris, why don't we start with you? I think I just want one key takeaway that you want to share with email marketers um, related to VMC and, you know, what, what do they need to know? What do you want them to walk away and say that they can go back to their organization with that knowledge to get this going? Uh, sure. Well, I I was in a presentation yesterday, and one of the key takeaways um, that we wanted to give in that presentation is that uh, the the verified mark certificate in the that's being used in the Google Pilot, if it goes into GA, um, you know, hopefully that will be soon. But the amount of time it takes to uh, just look up and see what your your posture is for um, your trademark itself you might wanna go ahead and look at that because if you haven't filed for a trademark or you don't have a trademark that is usable, um, uh, for in other words, marketing might be using a, a logo that has not trademarked yet um, because you know they've kind of fallen behind. There's sometimes a disconnect in an organization. You wanna get it in front of that and because that could take uh, literally months to uh, file that trademark. And then um, simultaneously, uh, you you might want to start looking at your DMARC um, posture as well. If you don't have that uh, working, um, you know, to uh, a policy of, in, in this case, what we're doing for, for uh, Gmail is we're, we're, there's a requirement that the DMARC policy is set to a quarantine at hundred percent or, or reject. So um, that uh, as Mark alluded to um, can take a little bit of time to wrap your head around uh, and so both those things uh, need to be on a simultaneous path. Uh, so that would be my main takeaway. You know, check out your trademark and uh, look at your DMARC. So trademarks, even though you might think that it might be trademarked, oftentimes they might not be. Um, I think that's something that happens more often than not in many organizations. Um, Jacob, is there one key takeaway that you would like to share with the audience um, before we get any questions? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you have to look at Vimy as something you're doing for for the, the recipient. It's, uh, I often hear uh, the question like, how will it improve my open rates and so on? Right. So in, in my opinion, the, the, the improvements of open rates that have been observed by uh, many who uh, deployed BIMI were not really caused by the BIMI itself, but because they did the DMARC. They did the DMARC enforcement and the, the BIMI was a cherry on top. So uh, we've, run a, we've run a study uh, two years ago with uh, an unnamed mailbox provider and several big brands from all over the world uh, where, uh, where the provider did a, did a A-B test uh, to, to see what's the impact. And uh, we couldn't uh, measure any uh, real impact. But the important part uh, to remember is this is for, for the recipient. All the studies that, uh, that you can look at uh, will show you that the first thing the recipient is looking at is not the subject, it is the actual sender from. That's the first thing you, you look at when you get an email. Then if you know the sender, you look at the, the subject. The Beamy logo is the shortcut. Instead of uh, having to, uh, having to uh, read the sender, you look at the picture. It's the same with uh, with your phone. You know, you, you look at the picture. Up, you know who's calling without reading it, and it's it's the same. It simply makes a better user experience. So, brand managers, marketers should look at it as not only an opportunity to get more brand impressions, but most importantly, to make recipient uh, happy, improve the user experience. Thank you. So we do have a couple of audience questions that are coming through. 
Um, Chris Bailey, I'm going to um, punt, punt this over to you. Um, beyond email, where do you see the applications of Vimy? That's a really good question. Um, so let me just you know quickly review what uh, Bimi is, um, and you know in in reference to at least um, the VMC, the one that I'm working very closely with. So the, the Bimi record is associated with the DNS. Uh, so there's a, a literally, uh, in case you're not familiar with when we're talking about uh, a text record. We're literally just talking about a location of where the, the SVG file is located, the image file, and where the, the certificate is located. So um, once that information is available, uh, it could be used for other functions. And so um, although we're talking about mailbox providers uh, here that can pull that information and use it in their environment, uh, you could actually use it uh, for other reasons with um, the VMC itself, it's actually, it's a cryptographic container, um, although it doesn't really rely on the private key. Um, there could be a use for the private key in the future, so you could see it uh, expanding potentially in use. That is not the objective of BIMI, but the vehicle is available. Uh, so it can split that up into two parts. One is the image could be pulled into other environments uh, potentially, uh, besides mailboxes, um, and two, the 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 VMC itself, um, the 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 container, uh, might be able to be leveraged um, in a way that could be used for other uh, you know potentially cryptographic functions. Uh, neither uh, of these uh, are basically, I would say, uh, immediate uh, concerns, um, but uh, the capability is there. Jacob? I would add to that. I, I already know quite a, quite a few possible use cases for Beamy outside of uh, email ecosystem. Uh, it could be used uh, for uh, uh, for company presentations, uh, like back in the day where Yahoo had a catalog uh, where you had all the companies. So these company listings can be extended with the logo that is pulled from Beamy and. Because it is tied to a domain, it's very simple. I know at least about one uh, one uh, portal uh, that is looking into this, but uh, the the use cases are uh, you know, quite quite far reaching. You know, you can you can think about uh, the the apps for mobile phones to rely on the BB uh, instead of having the logo embedded in the future. Uh, you know, the browser. If if you spend, if you keep in mind that it's square, uh, you know, and right now you have to manage fab icons, you have to manage your company uh, company logo on your LinkedIn, on your Facebook, on your Twitter, on, you know, left and right, everywhere you go, you you have to manage it in so many places. You know, Beamy can easily be the centralized source of. Uh, the right logo, right indicator for different use cases. And combined with a VMC, it can be the trusted source of uh, brand logo. And that's for marketers and for their customers as well, right? So we have another question here about one inbox provider that we haven't mentioned yet. Um, I'm not sure who wants to take this one. So I'm just going to ask the question. Do you think Microsoft will adopt this or are they going to stick to the brand cards? It's going to take them long before they realize. Yeah, I, I hope uh, I hope Microsoft um, does look at this. They Just to let everyone know, I'm going to give a little bit of history. Um, this, this topic was actually brought up uh, almost five years ago. Um, and, uh, and, and Microsoft was looking to solve this problem and I was working I'm gonna give a shout out to Terry Zank over at Facebook, um, but he's uh, I was working with him on this on this project, and um, this was a this is something uh, that they were seriously considering. So um, you know that there is a there is a history there um, with Microsoft. The um, the 
you can imagine that uh, once the uh, verify mark certificate um, especially takes off um, and that it would be easy for someone to hook into that infrastructure uh, and that could be um, you know, what uh, Microsoft decides to do. Obviously, I can't speak for Microsoft. Um, and Microsoft, you know, as far as I know, has not made a public uh, commitment to this, uh, but the infrastructure would just be there to tap into. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm going to get back to our takeaways. So Rahul, before we have about nine minutes left in our session here, is there any key takeaway that you want to make sure that our audience learns from you before we are done for today? Sure. Um, maybe I'll try a different tact over here because uh, I know that one of the things that's come up a bit is the fact that uh, you know when when marketers look at let's say DMARC and BIMI, it can look a little bit daunting given that they now have to start talking to their folks in legal, their folks in IT, uh, if they're not you know as conveniently collate co-located as in Mark's case, and. Um, and I think there might be there might be some reluctance to actually get this going. But what we've seen is is actually the the opposite because we know, uh, you know, especially when we talk to a lot of the IT folks inside organizations, uh, they see BIMI as a great opportunity to get all this stuff done around email that they've never got around to doing because now there's a real benefit that they can speak to people about. So we've seen IT teams actually pull in marketing and educate them about you know, the potential benefits of BIMI and why they should be doing all of this together and actually work quite collaboratively in getting the project, the priority and, and the airtime that it needs inside the organization. So similarly, I would encourage the marketers to actually try and reach out to their IT colleagues and, and look at that you know, organizational DMOC status and figure out how they can move these things forward because there are a lot of benefits. Like one of the things we didn't talk about but does happen um, is that you know quite quite a quite a quite often we see organizations actually discover a lot of services that uh, they can consolidate. You know we had one customer who had um, I don't know four different marketing comms platforms when they really only wanted one. So it was a great way for IT to actually find out what's going on in the organization and reduce cost and reduce complexity because they can see stuff that otherwise you'd never be able to see. So there are lots of reasons for for doing this, you know, beyond brand, beyond BIMI, beyond deliverability, beyond all the other potential side benefits. Um, so, you know, framed correctly, I think um, I, IT teams in our experience are actually pretty open to these conversations. So I'd encourage marketers to, you know, go out there and, and have that conversation with their colleagues. Mark, why don't you put on your IT hat for a moment? Um, thinking of the email marketers who are listening and watching us now, how how would you say that they should approach and have that open up the conversation as Raul uh, as Rahul just recommended? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you know I'm reflecting on on our journey and it, and we didn't start with Bimi in mind, right? We started with what's happening with our email programs, and if I go back and think about where we were two years ago, we were seeing a change in behavior that we didn't understand. Why, why were our open rates and engagement rates dropping when we've changed nothing? Like we, we haven't changed anything, but things are worse. And what we found was that um, engagement and delivery to consumer, quote unquote, consumer email services like Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, were just really bad. And they had been bad for a long time and getting wor increasingly worse. And so we started having that conversation with the IT, with our marketing operations people, like what's happening here? Did, let's take an audit of the things that are generating, you know, the Marketo platform in this case, or some of our other secondary email platforms. And it was sort of a collaborative, you know, why is this happening? And, and what, is, what is really going on here? Um, it led to an enormous amount of testing on the marketing side, subject lines and the rest of the stuff that we all do as marketers, but it quickly led to the discovery and understanding of um, DMARC, generally speaking, which obviously then led to, and Jen, when we worked together, this was some of the things we talked about, like, oh, what's this BIMI thing? So it was just the sort of the roadmap was laid out in front of us, like, oh, this is what modern email marketing looks like. There's a much more heavy IT component to it that we need to understand 
It's not just about writing sexy mm -hmm. subject lines, right? And right. Um, I could, we could go on and on about all the testing that we did, which is like unbelievable amount of stuff that we learned to goose the engagement. But at the end of the day, you know, there's this other side of it. And so collaborating with the tech teams in our case meant not just our internal teams, but the vendors as well. Like, hey, what, you know, Marketo is reporting a deliverability number of X, but we know in fact, that's not the same thing as deliverability to the inbox. And just being able to have those conversations with both the technology side on the vendors and internally, um, you know, it was all in the service of the business for us. Right. And if we look back about a year and a half ago when we revealed the periodic table of email optimization and deliverability in Boston, fun little side fact, everybody, the computer during that presentation crashed the moment that I revealed it and Mark was smart enough to think on his feet and grabbed the physical posters, ran up to the stage so that I could start talking through that periodic table. But I think as we went through that exercise, Mark, we, I mean, that deliverability and email periodic table started as a list in my head. And I think we all discovered that email was much more technical and IT than it was marketing. And we really need those fundamentals and that groundwork to be laid out properly in order to have your email program be successful. I completely agree. And I think that was a moment as a marketer with my marketing hat on, it's like, oh wait, it's not just about copywriting and from lines. It, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, that's the tip of the iceberg. There's an ocean and the rest of the iceberg underneath of it that has to be set up properly. And again, that was the beginning of our and my personal journey in terms of like, what is all this stuff? Um, and so it's really important to understand both sides of it. Thank you. Is there anything that any of you guys would like to say before we go? We have about two minutes left here, and I just want to make sure that everybody gets their points out to the audience so that they can go back to their organizations tonight and start talking about how they want to deploy Boomi. Yeah, I'd like to add to to Mark's, you know, uh, chasing the, the the extra engagement and subject lines and everything. So with DMARC and Bimi and everything else, it's pretty much the same on the technology side. You know, DMARC will give you a certain certain amount of increase in open rates. So will uh, so will Bimi in the end, right? It, it may not be right away when you switch it on, and you know, you shouldn't expect miracles, you know, happening the day you deploy DMARC and deploy it. It will take a while, but uh, the results will be there. And it's you know, it's long gone when, when you could expect, you know, a 10, 20% boost, you know, from day to day just by changing the subject line, right? It's, uh, it's a long-term thing. And uh, the, the extra 2% uh, may mean a lot in, in terms of revenue. Absolutely, thank you. Anybody else? We have our countdown timer at a minute and 35 seconds. Um, yeah, I would, I would I just turn my camera off by accident. I would, um, <laughs> in attempting to unmute myself. Welcome back. Um, yeah, I, I would say that if you're on the marketing side, this is a worthy exercise to get educated on. It, it's an important thing, it's not going away. You may not ever get to Bimmy and that might be okay. But I think understanding the mechanics of why email works and how it works in, in this modern age is really important. And if you're on the tech side, this is value, right? The, the, the technology teams that understand how to bring value to the business are successful technology teams. And so, you know, it's not just about keeping the lights on or keeping email flowing. It's about improving business outcomes. So this is a, I think this is a really worthy topic. And frankly, I'm surprised I'm saying that because a year ago I didn't, I wasn't sure, but now I'm, now I'm convinced. I agree about a year and a half ago, I wasn't so sure myself. And I do remember when we were putting together that periodic table, Bimmy wasn't on it originally. It, it wasn't. And um, when we had added it, it seemed so like, you know, they, there was no tangible um, ten, tangentiality <laughs> to it. <laughs> um, but I'm really glad to see that everything has evolved. And I'm glad, Mark, that your journey has gotten you to this point where you are. Um, and I'd also like to say thank you to each and every single one of you for being here today. I think that we just had a really great conversation. I hope that marketers and email marketers have some great takeaways from this. So thank you all so much. Yep. Thank you. Bye, thank everybody. You,